Okay, we're going to talk about Chapter 5. Chapter 5's topic is probability distributions. And we're actually going to talk in Chapter 5 about something called discrete probability distributions for the most part. And we'll talk about what that means. So as you go through your notes, and I have a copy up here, so if you have a question, I'll be able to answer it as we go along. We're going to get some terminology down and then we're going to do some examples. So first thing we need to talk about is random variables. Random indicates that we're going to be able to apply probability distributions and variable is the, uh, the value of whatever it is that we're collecting. So a random variable that assumes a value determined by chance or random outcome. And it has to be a quantitative value. It has to be something that we're counting or measuring. That's what the random variable is. So a random variable is a quantitative variable that represents a numerical uh, outcome or value associated with the outcome of a probability experiment and it is determined by chance. A random variable is discrete if the number of possible outcomes is finite or countable. The emphasis is on that word countable. Discrete random variables are determined by a count. One, two, three, four, five, six. A random variable is continuous if it can take on any value within an interval. The possible outcomes can't be listed. Continuous random variables are determined by, make, by taking a measurement. Okay? They're actually a measurement. The discrete probability distribution that we're going to look at in particular in Chapter 5 is going to be called the binomial probability distribution. We will take on uh, continuous random variables in Chapter 6 when we talk about the normal probability distribution. And that will be next class. So based on the fact that discrete means that you can count it and continuous means you have to measure it, looking at these different examples that you've got in front of you, X represents the number of players on a basketball team. How many players could be on a basketball team? Let's just talk about the ones that could be on court at one time. That's discrete because you determined the answer to my question, how many, by counting those players. You don't weigh them or measure them and see how tall they are. You just want to know how many of them there are, so you're going to count. The second example, X represents the length of time it takes to swim four laps in a pool. Is that discrete or is it continuous? Because you need what? You need to measure it. You need to measure it. Stopwatch or watch the clock, something. Okay, so you need a device. You can't just count. Number three is the number of daffodils planted in a garden. How do you determine how many daffodils there are in the garden? You count them so they are discrete. X represents the height of seventh graders. Continuous because you have to measure them with a yardstick or a tape measure or a meter stick or some kind of measuring device. The way we're going to define a probability distribution is we're going to assign probability to the random variable. And that probability will be based upon the number of times that variable occurs in the entire sample space, just like we talked about in probability in chapter 4. The probability distribution is a summary of all the different possible values of the random variable. It's a description that gives the probability for each value of the random variable and it's usually expressed in the format of a graph or a table or a formula.
the requirements for a probability distribution, and all of these are not necessarily in your notes, but, I, but this one is, um, the sum of the probabilities is equal to one. We actually talked about that in chapter, uh, in chapter four. But if you add up all the probabilities for a given event, that that has to equal one, because if you've got all the probabilities of all the possible ways that event comes out, well, that can't total up to more than one because you can't say that there's a 110% chance that something's gonna happen. The highest percent chance of something happening is 100%. If you tell me the probability of something is 100%, that means it's absolutely dead certain gonna happen. There's no way that it can't happen. Everything else is somewhere between zero and one because the probability that of an event being zero tells me that that event can't happen. If we go outside tonight and look up in the sky, the event of seeing two moons has a probability of zero because we only have one moon for this planet, okay? So every individual value of x has its own probability and the probabilities of all those individual values of x is going to be a fraction or a decimal between 0 and 1. Higher values of the fractions and decimals means something is more likely. Lower values means it's less likely. So based on those last two rules, is this a proper discrete probability distribution? This is a table. It gives the values of the random variable 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It might be counting how many cars in a household. It might be counting the number of children in a household. Uh, it could be counting the number of books or the number of courses that you're taking. So there are the probabilities. The probability of none is 0.10, of 1 is 0.2, of 2 is 0.3, then of 3 is 0.2, and 4 is 0.10. Is that a legal, legitimate probability distribution? Okay, what does it add up to? Only adds up to 90%. So no, this is not a legitimate probability distribution. So you have to look at the sum of the probabilities. The other thing that might have been wrong would have been if one of these probabilities was negative. You don't have negative probability. Or if one of them had been one point something. You can't have probabilities that are greater than one. Probability distributions have to fit all those requirements that we already talked about. <coughs> so is that one a legitimate probability distribution? No. Why not? It, goes past. it goes past one, that's right. So no, if you add up to 0 0.243, 0 0.167, 0 0.213, 0 0.149, 0 0.232, and 0 0.164, that adds up to more than one. So that is not a legitimate probability distribution. If you need to find the mean and the expect or the expectation because the mean and probability is referred to as the expected value or the expectation and it's also referred to as the long run average if you need to find the mean for a probability distribution you multiply the x's times the probabilities and then add that column up now the easiest way to actually find that is not using that formula but to actually use your calculator. Your calculator will find the mean and the standard deviation for you. So if we've got this probability distribution, the way that we're going to find the mean and standard deviation is we're going to take the calculator and we're going to go to the stat button and choose edit to go into our list, which we've used before to find means and standard deviations. And in the first list, we're going to put in the numbers that are legal values for x. So we're apparently counting something that could go from 0 to 5. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 
are the possible values of x. The probability of zero is very small, 0 0.0005. And notice when I type that in, even though I typed in a decimal in three zeros and five, it shows me the answer in scientific notation. Be sure that you can convert scientific notation into regular decimal notation. That's something that you learned in 0530 and you need to still apply that in this class. So then the probability of one is decimal 0091 decimal 0648, decimal 2297, decimal 4072, decimal 2887. Normally I would tell you to add up those probabilities and make sure that they add up to one, but the calculator is actually going to do that for us. It's going to check that for us. So now that we've got the data in X is in list one, probabilities in list two, then we go to stat and we write error over to the calc menu and we choose one variable statistics and then we enter the two lists where the probability distribution is stored. And the way that you know your probability is added up to one is your if you look at the last thing you see on the screen before you scroll down, it says n equals 1. That's the sum of list 2. The sum of list 2 is 1. So then the mean, and that is not the correct symbol by the way, it says x bar, but x bar and mu are calculated the same way. So actually it is mu equals 3.9001. Yes. Fix your Alright, so now that we've got this, even though I showed you how to do it with the formula there, we've done the whole process on the calculator. And the thing that I want you to be sure that you understand is that the result of this calculation
rather than you needing to memorize those formulas, when we do this on the calculator, and it tells us to find the mean and standard deviation and variance, the calculator says x bar equals 3.9001. That's not the correct notation because the mean of a probability distribution is always going to be mu. Not x bar. Okay. And the standard deviation, if you'll notice here on your calculator, it doesn't even give you a sample standard deviation. That's because this is not a sample. It's a population. So the standard deviation for this probability distribution is 0 0.926. And if you wanted the variance, which is sigma squared, then what you need to do is you need to take this value 0.926023.7524. You need to take that number and actually square it. And I don't mean square 0.926. I mean square the whole thing and then round. So type in 0.9 six zero two three seven five two four and hit your x squared and that gives you the variance and if you want to round the variance now to point eight five eight that would be fine but if you don't use all the decimals you're going to lose some accuracy and it'll be enough loss of accuracy sometimes in my math lab that it'll actually tell you the answer's wrong because the answer, if you use just the three, di just the three digit standard deviation and square it, it may be off in that third decimal place when you square it. So use all the decimals and then square it. So your explanation is on your notes there for how you actually do this on the calculator. Here's your calculator steps. So they're written down for you. So now we need to work some examples. And the examples are the one on the handout, so ah. We're going to go back to this and we're going to work some examples together. So this problem says a survey asks a sample of families how many televisions are in their household. And the information is actually presented to us here in two different ways. This is a probability histogram. And if you notice the values that are in the probability histogram here that we have actually correspond to the numbers that we have in the table because for the value 0, the probability is 0.12, which gives us this entry. And for the value of 1, the number of televisions is 1, then 11% or 0.11 of the households had one television. 0.38 or 38% had two televisions. 0.26 or 26% had three. And that leaves 13% that had four. 
So if we want to determine if this is a discrete probability distribution, what do we need to check for? Yeah, I mean, we can kind of look down the column and tell that they're all between 0 and 1. The question is, does it add up to 1? So add up 0 0.12, 0 0.11, 0 0.38, 0 0.26, and 0 0.13, what do you get? You do get 1. So is it a probability distribution? Yes. So be sure that you check for both conditions. All your probability column has to be between 0 and 1, and they have to add up to 1. And remember, you're only looking at the probability column to determine whether or not it's a probability distribution. You don't care about the values of x. You're only interested in the probabilities if you're trying to determine if it's a discrete probability distribution. So in your expected value, your standard deviation and variance, we're going to use the calculator to find those. So we'll get the table up there. Go to stat and edit. And the only thing I really need to do in list one is just delete the five. <coughs> and then go over and enter in my probabilities in list two. So 0 0.12, 0 0.11, 0 0.38, 0 0.26, 0, whoops, 0 0.13, and then I'll delete that last one because that was not what we needed. And I see that I messed up, so this should be 0 0.26, not 0 0.026. So make sure you get your probabilities in there correctly because if they're not correct and then you give me a wrong answer, I'm, got, I'm not going to know why that answer is wrong. So be sure you edit your numbers on your calculator carefully. Bad information in, bad information comes out. So then you go back to your stat button, right arrow to calc, one variable statistics, your x's are in list one, your frequencies are list two. First thing you check, if you haven't already done so, is does that add up to one? And it did. So then it says that our mean is 2.17. That's the expected value. The standard deviation is 1.158. And my variance is going to be that 1.158.05872 squared. So that's going to be 1.341. Yeah, go so three decimal places. It would be okay to say this is 2.2, but since it actually ends at two decimal places, just go ahead and put them both down. Okay? Now, the correct symbol here, once again, be sure you've got the right symbols. That one is sigma, and that one is sigma squared. Be sure you're using the right symbols. And since this just used the E of X, remember that this is also mu. U and E of X are the same thing. Those are exactly the same. Okay? Be sure you get correct symbols. I'm going to give you a list, and I will actually put it in with the test 2 review. I'm going to give you a list of symbols that you're going to need to memorize. And that list is going to be a little longer than it was last time. And then for the third test, you'll get, an, uh, you'll get some more symbols on the list that you'll need to memorize. And you'll have to know all of those symbols for the final exam. Now, my suggestion is, you know, get yourself some index cards and make flashcards if you're a hands-on kind of person. 
or there's all kinds of apps that make flashcards for you so that you can just flip through them. So let's go on to the next example. Okay, this is example two, and it says the following table lists the, the number of peas with green pods among eight offspring peas. So we're going to skip over the determining if it's a discrete probability distribution because I'm going to tell you actually that it is, but we're going to verify that when we actually put it in the calculator since you'd have to add it up to find it out anyway. But all of these are between zero and one, so condition number one is met. So the only other condition we're gonna to have to be sure we meet is whether or not the P of X column adds up to one. And the calculator will do that for us without us having to enter data twice. So we'll go over here and put the numbers in list one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, because we're talking about eight P's. And the probability that none of those eight is, um, has a green pod is pretty close to zero. So only having none or one, since both those probabilities are zero or a little bit higher than zero, but not much. Since, since those are both close to zero, then we say, well, you know, it's not really gonna be likely. We'd be shocked if we had eight pea plants and only um, six of them or seven of them had green peas. Now the next probability is also very small. It would still qualify as unusual, 0.004. And actually, only having three is fairly unusual, 0.023. Having four of them is a little bit more likely, 0.087. That's a lot more likely that you have five, 0.208, or six, 0.311. And it's fairly likely that you'd have 7.267, but less likely that you'd have all eight. So if I'm looking at this probability distribution before I actually answer these questions, if you grew eight pea plants, how many of those pea plants do you think are going to have green pea pods? Six? Maybe five? No, five's pretty high, pretty high probability too. I would kind of expect five, six, or seven. So when I get my expected value, my expected value is probably going to be around six. It has the highest probability and the two numbers on either side of it have pretty similar probabilities. So I would say it's more likely going to be six or maybe between six and seven because this has a higher probability than five does. Okay? So if you kind of think about this logically, you're going to know if your answer makes sense or not. So when we do the expected value, and remember that's going to be mu on the calculator, we're going to do stat calc, one of our stats, x is in list one, frequencies are in list two. 
it says the mean is exactly 6, which we kind of expected. It also says the standard deviation is 1.222. And before I go on and calculate the variance, let me kind of, and this is sort of going back through uh, some concepts that we had in chapter one. What this basically means is that what I expect to happen using your range rule of thumb, is I, I expect there to be between six minus two times 1.222 to six plus two times 1.222 to be the interval that contains almost all of the possible outcomes. So two times 1.222 is 6 minus 2.444 to 6 plus 2.444. And 6 plus 2.244 is actually 8.444, which if you go down here, 8 is the largest number. So it's well within what I expect to happen. And the 6 minus 2.444 is 3.556. Now, realistically, we can't have part of the peak. So this interval, realistically, if you round properly, would be between 4 and 8. And if you look over here at the table, that's the ones that have the higher probabilities. All of their probabilities are more than 0.05. The only ones that are not in that interval are the ones that have a probability of less than 0.05. So your range rule of thumb didn't go away, it's still with you. That's why we calculate mean and standard deviation. Now the variance, once again, you be sure you use all those decimals. And the variance is 1.494. 1 okay to round to three, but keep all your decimals before you round. Okay? I'm trying to get it where you can still see everything. Does that do it? So what I did with that last part out here, right here, is I actually answered this next question. The next question says use the range rule of thumb to identify a range of values containing the usual number of p's with green pods. So it would be usual to have four, five, six, seven, or eight. It would be unusual to have none, one, two, or three. So then to answer our questions, that's the usual number. Would it be unusual to get only one P with a green pod? Yes, very unusual. Then we have the next question. Find the probability of getting exactly seven P's with green pods. Well, in order to answer that question, all we really need to do is look at that table. Exactly seven. There's the probability. 
Now the way to write this, and this is correct probability notation, I expect you to use correct probability notation on your test, which means when you're doing your worksheets and doing your homework, you need to use correct probability notation all the time. Because if you don't, then you're not going to be in the habit of doing it on the test. And then if you don't do it on the test, I do count off if you don't have correct notation. Okay? So be sure you practice it so that you'll just automatically do it on the test. Because you're the one that's going to be mad at me, when you should be mad at you, when I take off points for not using correct notation because I've told you up front that I do. So practice so that you won't mess up. So the correct probability notation is P parentheses X equals 7 equals 0 0.267. Don't just tell me this is the answer. Tell me the answer in probability notation. Okay? So then the next question says find the probability of getting 7 or more. What inequality symbol do you use to say seven or more? Yeah, greater than with the line under it, which means greater than or equal to, okay? Seven or eight is seven or more. And in order to get that answer, I'm not only looking at 7, but I'm also looking at 8. So what I need to do with those then is I need to add the probability for 7 to the probability for 8. And then that would be 0 0.367. And then our last question says, find the probability of getting less than 4. How many is less than 4? Okay. Or 2, or 1, or 0. Does it include 4? No. So, what we're actually looking at here is that x is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3. But the right way to write that is probability that x is less than 4. So in order to do that, then we're going to need to go back up to that probability distribution. and look for where we actually have less than 4. So we're going to go back to the table. 0, 1, 2, 3. And we're going to add those all together. Probability x is equal to 0 was 0. For 1 it was 0. For 2 it was 0 0.004. For 3 it was 0 0.023. So the probability that x is less than 4 is 0 0.027. Okay? Questions so far? Okay, now it's time to shift gears again because we're going to go back and do something called binomial probability distributions. So we're going to go back to the PowerPoint.
probabilities associated with binomial or Bernoulli experiments where there are two possible outcomes of each, of each trial are called binomial probabilities. What I want you to understand is that binomial actually comes from two Latin words. Bi means two. And nomial, if you remember back, we had nominal level data that was just names. Well, this is the same root word, names. Two names. Binomial, two names. And the two names are success and failure. Something either happens or it fails to happen. Now, as far as, you know, where did this French-sounding word Bernoulli come from? Bernoulli was a probability uh, theoreticist. So if you need somebody to hate over binomial probability, you can throw rocks at his name or put him in the middle of a dartboard because he's the one that came up with all this. He's French. So these are the key features of a binomial experiment. Key feature number one, there's a fixed number of trials. The fixed number of trials is like the P's that we were talking about in our last example. You're going to actually look and see how many total outcomes there are. So there's a fixed number of potential outcomes. We're going to denote the number of trials by the letter N. And we're going to determine what it is by counting how many outcomes there are. Those trials have to be independent. So if you remember from chapter four, two events are only independent if one doesn't influence whether or not the next one occurs. So when we do these trials, these experiments, the outcome of the previous experiment cannot influence the one that comes after it, and the outcome of the one that came before the next one can't influence uh, its outcome. So those trials are independent, and the way that we get that to happen is that they have to happen under identical conditions. So you might think of this as sampling with replacement so that everything is identical every time we do a new experiment. And this is where the two names comes in. Every trial has only two possible outcomes. This goes back to the complement rule we talked about in probability where event A either happens or it does not happen. Those are the only two outcomes. If event A, regardless of what A is, if event A happens, we refer to that as, a, that as a success. And if it doesn't happen, then we refer to that as a failure. Okay? Now, success and failure don't mean good things versus bad things. Don't get that fixed in your mind. Success just means it happened. What we're looking for happened. Failure means whatever it is we're counting didn't happen this time. And for each individual trial, the probability of success is always going to be the same. It can't change every time you do it again. In other words, here again, we're talking about sampling with replacement. We always start out with the same number that we did to start with. We didn't take one out and set it aside which changes the number of potential outcomes for the next trial. So the probability of success has to remain the same. And then we call the probability of success P, and the probability of failure is Q. If you add P plus Q, you get one because either it succeeded or it failed. There's nothing else that can happen. And because P plus Q is equal to one, if you've got P, you can find Q by subtracting P from one. That's your complement rule again. So chapter four isn't going away, we're just using it to build more information. The central problem that we're gonna be looking at is to find the probability of what we call R successes 
out of n trials. Now in reality, it's not going to be r, we're going to call r x. x is going to represent how many successes. So these are all the things in summary that you need to have a binomial trial. Repeated independent trials where the number of trials is n, the two outcomes are success and failure, and you should be able to, if I ask you, this is the experiment, what is success, what is failure? And you should be able to explain to me in a sentence what success looks like and what failure looks like. And then the number of successes is R or X. And the probability of success is P and the probability of failure is one minus P. Now, this is the formula. Look at that formula and then say, thank God I don't have to do that formula. <laughs> because you don't have to do that formula. It works. It's really not all that difficult. It looks terrible, but it really isn't all that difficult. But the formula is built into your TI calculator. We will use the calculator. Yes? <coughs> it is called a factorial. In factorial means literally, and I'll just go ahead and write this on the overhead for you because it's a good time to do it. In factorial means you start at 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times until you get to n. <coughs> and you multiply them all together. Okay? For example, 5 factorial is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5. 1 times 2 is 2, 2 times 3 is 6, 6 times 4 is 24, 24 times 5 is 120. Okay? Your calculator actually has a key that will calculate that for you. It's on your math PRB menu. Right there at number four. So if I wanted to, to do five factorial, I would go five, math, PRB, down to number four, pick the exclamation point, and hit enter, and it calculates it for me. So if you, that's why I said, you know, really that formula looks horrible, but since you know what this is, if you can pick out the values of n and p and x, you can plug into that formula and it's just a matter of using exponents and factorials. Okay? But you don't even need to do that. We're going to use the calculator for everything. Now, one more formula. You do need to know these. I told you you didn't need to know the others, but you do need to know these. Because the only way to get the mean and standard deviation for a binomial probability distribution is either, either to create the whole blessed distribution, which can be a little tedious if you have 25 or 30 different possible values for x, and put those in your calculator and get it to do one variable statistics, or to know these two little formulas. Because if all I ask you for is the mean and the standard deviation, of a binomial probability distribution, all you have to pick out n and p, figure out what q is, and use these formulas, and you never have to build that table. And once again, remember that the mean is also called the expected value. And we'll do an experiment and talk about why these formulas work. 
This one's not necessarily intuitive, but this one actually turns out it's very intuitive if you think about it. So the mean is mu equals n times p. The standard deviation is sigma equals the square root of n times p times q. n times p times q without the square root. So here's our first example of a binomial experiment. A doctor tells you that 80% of the time a certain type of surgery is successful. If the surgery is performed seven times, find the probability that exactly six of the surgeries will be successful. Now before I go on and talk about finding N and P and Q, would you feel good if you had to have this surgery? Would you feel good about your chances of it being successful for you? Why not, Nick? Well, we didn't say what the success, what the surgery was. Yeah. It might be carpal tunnel syndrome, or it might be um, something else that's relatively minor, you know, taking the tonsils out yeah, and stop. Yeah, like like yeah, I, found yeah I, I felt the way you did when I had cataract surgery. And they told me, now there is uh, like a 0.001% chance. I'm like, what? <laughs> no, no, that's not acceptable. <laughs> so I was actually much more worried about that than I was surgeries that I've had before where they tell you, you know, there, there is a small possibility you could die from the surgery. Well, okay, I was in enough pain, I had the surgery anyway. Yeah. But my eyes, no, 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 don't tell me I'm going to go blind. So I got to see. N, number of trials, what is N? How many trials are we talking? Seven. Seven, Seven because they're going to perform the surgery how many times? Seven. Seven times. What is P? Remember, P is the probability <coughs> the surgery is successful. Eighty. It's 0.80. 0.80. We're not going to be able to use it as a percentage. We have to change it to a decimal. So it's going to be 0 0.8. Then what's the probability it's not successful? Nick knows. 0 0.2. 0 0.2. <laughs> he looked at that first. A lot of us would. But we want to find the probability that it's successful exactly six times out of the seven. What's X? Six. six. Okay. So what we're actually looking for here is the probability that x equals 6 out of the 7 trials with an 80% success rate. Now I'm going to show you how to put it into your calculator, but before I do that, take into account they're going to do the surgery 7 times and each trial is independent, each surgery is independent, it's different people, different doctors, different rooms. 80% of the time it's successful. How many of the seven surgeries do you think are going to be successful? Without me giving you a formula. If I ask you to tell me ballpark, how many of those seven surgeries do you think are going to be successful, what would you tell me? Based on the probabilities. Nick says five. I have somebody that says six. Why are you choosing five and six? Okay, so wouldn't you say that 80% of those seven trials should be successful? So what's 80% of seven? 5.6. 5.6, which is why the answer five is very reasonable, and so is six, okay? That's how you find the expectation, even though there's a formula for it, which I kind of just led you to by saying it's the percentage of the number of trials. That's why that formula is what it is. 
a reasonable person would expect 80% of those seven surgeries to be successful. Okay? So now let's talk about how we find out that the probability that exactly six of them are successful. Follow along on your calculator. The way that you get to this menu and this is the same on both calculators but the menu may be look, look a little different. From your home screen press your second and your VARS key. What does it say above the VARS key? Yeah, DSTRB, right? Something like that. Those are distributions. Okay? These are probability distributions. All of these on this whole entire list are different kinds of probability distributions. We will use normal CDF. We will use inverse norm. Next chapter. There is a T distribution that we will not use. Although we will use it, we won't use these particular commands on your calculator. We won't get to the chi-squared distribution, that big X in the square is called a chi-square. We won't get to the chi-square distribution in this class, but it is a useful distribution. We won't use the F distribution because we don't do a test that requires that but we will do binomial distributions. There is a binomial PDF, if you will scroll down on your menu, it's located at zero on the TI-83, I think maybe on the 84, it's, it's, it's A. But the binomial PDF is what we're going to start with. I'm going to show you how to use CDF against my own better judgment because not all my classes get this, but I think y'all are going to get it. So I'm going to show you how to use it because it's a good shortcut. So we will use binomial PDF and in the next problem we'll use binomial CDF. They, it's the same formula but they do different things. So for the problem that we're looking at, and you've got your calculator in front of you right now, hit your second VARS key to get your distributions. Go down to zero and hit M. When you do that, on your home screen, it should say binomial PDF parenthesis and be sitting there waiting for you. Okay? We've identified N and P and X. We know that N is the number of trials, 7. P is the probability of success, that was 0.80. And we know that X is the number of successes we're trying to find the probabilities for, so that's 6. Enter those numbers in the parentheses with commas between them. When you're finished, close the parentheses and hit Enter. Do you get 0 0.3670016? Okay. You just calculated that big ugly formula I told you not to worry about. Now we're really close on time now because I want to give you plenty of time to do your quiz. 
So we're only going to do, <coughs> excuse me, we're only going to do one more example, and then I'll finish up by recording the rest of the examples for you, and you've got homework and showed it. Okay? Multiple choice test has eight questions. Each of those questions has three choices. One of those choices is correct. You want to know the probability that you guess exactly five questions correctly. What is in? That's the eight questions. What's P? Remember, that's the probability of guessing correctly on any one question. 33.33, one out of three. Fractions will work. Fractions actually work better than trying to change it to decimals. Because there's three choices for the answer, but only one of those choices is correct. Okay? So you've got a one-third chance of picking the correct answer if all you're doing is guessing. So your probability of success is one-third or .33. Now, logically, if I give you a quiz with eight questions and you didn't study and all you do is guess on all of them, how many do you think you're going to get right? <clears throat> Probably two, because a third of eight is somewhere between two and three. So you might get two or three. Are you going to pass based on guessing? No. No, which is something you instinctively know. But, you know, hey, I might get two or three of them, right? Why not guess, right? <coughs> and X is five, because that's how many you want to get right. So do your binomial PDF and see if you get what I do. You put one-third into the binomial. Uh-huh. You put in one-third, one divided by three. That way you don't have to worry about changing it to a percentage or a decimal. Okay. Okay, your yours actually asking yours independently. So it says how many trials? Hey, what's the value of P? One divided by three. What's the value of X? Five. Okay. It just asks you for it each piece at a time without commas. Okay? So did you get what I got? I got .06828227.4, which is just fine if you call that .068. Okay, so the probability you guess five out of the eight correctly, which, you know, five out of eight would be passing. But there's a 6.8% chance you're going to pass if you didn't study. Okay. You didn't get what I got? problems twice to be sure you get the same answer both times because you're doing it right yeah okay <clears throat> 